Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. Late during the night of March 13th and into the early morning hours of March 14th, a total lunar eclipse will be visible across most of North America. And today we're going to get a little bit more insight into this event. Today we're going to talk with Dr. Noah Petro, who is a project scientist for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and for the upcoming Artemis 3 mission. So, Dr. Noah Petro, thank you for uh, joining us today and, you know, getting to help us know a little bit more um, about this lunar eclipse and what's going on with it. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, what exactly is it that uh, causes a lunar eclipse? Quite simply, a lunar eclipse is caused by the, the, the alignment of both the Earth and the Moon and the Sun. And so it takes all three of those things to come together. I'm going to use a little visual display. I've got a Moon here and an Earth here, and if you're the Sun, Basically, what has to happen is that the moon passes behind the Earth, so the Earth is between the moon and the sun, and what we hap happens during an eclipse is that the moon dims. It goes into the shadow of the Earth, and so it dims, and during totality, the moon turns this beautiful bright red color, and what that's caused by is the uh, basically the projection of every sunrise and sunset on the Earth going onto the surface of the moon. So during totality of the eclipse, You'll be treated to this beautiful red, uh, red moon. Uh, when it comes to these lunar eclipses, how often is it that they occur? Well, uh, they occur in, in clusters. So, so for instance, we haven't had a, a total lunar eclipse happen since 2022, and typically when they do occur, they happen in either twos or threes. And so, this is you know they they occur um, you know every few years. Now you have to be on the right hemisphere of the Earth. Imagine if I bring my example baseball back. Moon passes uh, behind the Earth, the people on the sun facing side where it's midday aren't going to be able to see it. So, uh, roughly every two to three years, we get to see one from where we are. Sometimes we are a little more lucky to happen more regularly. Um, but just like any cycle in space, uh, on average, it works out to being about every two years that we're treated to, to one. Now, we have an eclipse coming up, as you said, in, in March. The next one after that that is going to happen in space at all is in September. Um, but again, the other hemisphere of the Earth will we'll get to see that. And then we have another one in March. So we have a cluster of three happening within the next year. It's just that we're ha so fortunate that we get to see it from North America on March 14th. With the eclipse itself, it's, it's essentially a whole six hour long event. So can you explain uh, mm -hmm. what people will see during the different phases of this eclipse? A absolutely. So basically it's a Unlike a meteor stream or you know a, a, a solar eclipse like we had last year, um, you know this unfolds very slowly. The moon slowly moves into the Earth's shadow, and so it will go from being a beautiful, bright, full moon, and slowly dim as it passes in into the Earth's shadow. And you'll start seeing sort of portions of the moon dim as it gets more and more into into the Earth's shadow. When it's completely enveloped in the Earth's shadow, it goes in totality, and that lasts for about an hour or so before it starts coming out the other side. And so um, if it's cloudy at the beginning, it may clear up later on. You don't have to be in the right place at exactly the right time because it does not fold so, so slowly. One thing that many people may remember uh, from this past April when, you know, we had the total solar eclipse, obviously a little bit different. We're seeing the moon mm -hmm. go between the sun and the earth as opposed to the right. earth going between the moon and the, uh, moon and the sun. Right. Uh, but what's interesting is, is that with the uh, total solar eclipse, you had to have some sort of equipment until to, to totality uh, to see it. So what many may be wondering is uh, what do we need to view this lunar eclipse? Is any requ mm -hmm. special equipment uh, required to view this eclipse? Fortunately, for, for lunar eclipses, you just need two things, clear skies and clear eyes. Um, what, what I would say is if you have a, a clear night, you're in good shape. You want to be away from tall trees, things that might block your view. Um, so if you have an opportunity to go to a local field or even just, you know, in your neighborhood where there's, there's open space, if you're around bright lights, that can kind of take away from the experience. Um, and so, you know, you want to be at a spot that's relatively dim. But also you want to be away from tall trees so that you get a, an unobstructed view of the show before you. Um, and for you personally, for someone who is focused on the moon, you know, how cool is it for you uh, when an event like this gets more people to pay a little bit more attention to the moon? Well, I, I love that, right? Because it, it, it puts the moon back into the conversation and people, uh, you know, go out and look at it and appreciate it, right? I think we take the moon for granted too much that it's almost there and okay, but if you start paying attention to it, I always think that an eclipse is a great opportunity to start looking at the moon more often. Dust off that telescope, take out those binoculars, 
and look at it, but not just the night of the eclipse. Look at it two nights later, three nights later, a week later, and see how the moon's phases change your experience as you look at the moon, because as the moon goes through its phases, you can see different things. You can begin to infer and appreciate the moon in different ways. And then two months later, go out and look at the moon again and, you know, make it part of your regular daily habits. You know, you know walking the dog, going out for a, a walk, there's the moon and start paying attention to where the moon is in the sky throughout its phases. And I think you'll have a deeper appreciation, not just for the moon, but for our solar system uh, as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say whenever I personally look at stuff like that, it always makes me realize how small we are in this giant universe that we have uh, still yet to explore a whole lot of. But um, obviously, mm -hmm. speaking of, you know, exploring the moon and things like that, you're obviously the project uh, scientist for uh, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So what mm -hmm. all is all uh, being learned about that uh, with this orbiter? Yeah. Orbiter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. LRO has been at the moon now since 2009. So for over four, 15 years now, we have been mapping the moon essentially every single day since then. And you might think, well, wow, what, what more could there be to learn? Well, for the first year or two or three, we're, we're trying to take a snapshot of the moon. And now we're taking a movie of the moon. How is the moon changing over 15 years? And the discoveries that Elro is making show us how the moon, while it just sits out in space, interacts with space. We see the evidence of, of meteorite strikes forming new craters of landslides. We see evidence of the movement of water across the surface. And so we're beginning to learn about processes that take place over the decades time scale and not just a single snapshot. You know, I have a teenage son. And so imagine if I take a picture of him every few days, you can see his growth. We're actually able to see the moon changing and evolving underneath our feet at very small scales, but it becomes the foundation of our understanding of how all planets in the solar system operate and it sets a stage for this upcoming era of surface exploration where, hey, we're gonna be going to the surface. What new questions should we be asking? What measurements, measurements should we be making as we start this, this new journey back to the moon? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, it's going to be really helpful information to have for um, the other project you're also working on as well with the uh, Artemis 3 mission, So, um, which mm -hmm. that could land astronaut, astronauts on the moon for the first time since Apollo 17 back in uh, 1972. So um, obviously you kind of hit on that a little bit, but what work are you doing now to prepare for that mission? Yeah, so for, for Artemis 3, the, 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 we're doing a lot of work. We're getting our, our science teams ready the experiments to go to the surface, the geology investigation to go collect the rocks. We're assessing uh, multiple potential landing sites where we want to send the crew um, and understanding if we go to spot A, what are the things that we want to do there? What are the things we want to do at different locations? What are the same types of measurements that we want to make, samples that we want to collect at any location versus if we go to one, one particular spot, hey, we can do this really interesting study of, of volatiles or try to understand early formation of the moon early history of the moon. And so we're trying to understand the full suite of options that we're presented with when we, we do get crew back to the surface. Absolutely. That sounds all awesome and amazing. And hey, Dr. Noah Petro, thank you so much for joining us today. All really great stuff. And uh, if you want to check out more uh, Degrees of Science, we'll be here on the YouTube channel as well as uh, here on KWTX. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for having me.